Okay, so I, uh, I guess not now, but... Okay, is there like a, a clip on, or I should just like lean over the... So I can't really move around? Maybe we could push this a little bit further towards the center. And... Oh, uh, Mazier is fine. Mazier? Mazier. Mazier in French, or Mazier. Um, yeah. Wow, the speaker's like right in my ear there. So, let's see, maybe I will move this way. It's going to be very distracting to hear myself uh, 30 seconds delay. I'm not running it, no, not running it. <laughs> yeah, so really the people running it are my students who founded it back there. <laughs> Way of, Dayan right there, star PhD student who founded the company. Thank you very much for, for having me. So, uh, so yeah, as, as should be clear, this is uh, some uh, work that I did for uh, Stellar, and it wasn't part of my responsibilities in my day job at, at uh, Stanford. Um, so, uh, and I also apologize in advance. I know this is a, a, a Bitcoin dev meetup. This is not about Bitcoin, but if you're interested in Bitcoin, uh, you might be interested in Bitcoin's intellectual impact, and this is definitely uh, uh, heavily influenced by Bitcoin. So, uh, if you th think about what banks do, well, the core job of a bank is really uh, tracking customer assets and liabilities, right? You deposit a bunch of dollar bills and then the bank puts them in the drawer with everybody else's and they need to keep track of, of who, who owns how many of those dollars. So typically the way you would ensure robustness is through replication, right? So a bank here, we're gonna maybe replicate the ledger on three different servers so that, you know, if you lose one of them, it's no big deal. Uh, and that's all well and good uh, until you, start trying to send money between banks. So now suppose someone in China wants to send me $150 here in California. Uh, and again, some of you, given the forum, may be wondering, well, 
why would anyone want to do that? Just send you know a third of a Bitcoin instead. But so I'll ask you to indulge the uh, the assumption that like people might still want to send around fiat currency. Um, and so if you want to do that today, uh, what happens is you need to have basically one or more trusted intermediary correspondent banks that have relationships with, with the banks at the two end. And that adds a lot of delay and it adds a lot of cost. So you end up seeing uh, headlines like this where, you know, people in Africa are spending 22% of their money just to send money home to their families. Um, and it leads to this kind of ironic thing where all these, these banking uh, fees uh, end up hitting disproportionately people who are at the lower end of the income spectrum. So it turns out, ironically, to, that it's expensive to be poor in large part uh, because of these, these financial services. Now, it's not all bad news. If you're, if you're Western Union, this is great because they made $5.6 billion on, on uh, you know, whatever, $85 billion in transfers. So that's a six and a half cents on every dollar they transfer into pure profit, which is great. Um, but, you know, not so good for everyone else. And that also turns out to be the good case. So it's also the case, suppose that you want to send money to you know, Somalia or Mali or something like that. There are places where, in fact, you just might not be able to send the money because the, 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 there, there is no appropriate correspondent, anyone willing to play the correspondent banking uh, role in that case. So we see uh, headlines like this where people can't actually send money home to their families or where you know, people are actually literally paddling uh, boatfuls of money up the Niger River to, to get to money to people in Timbuktu because that's the most efficient way to get money up there. Okay, so if you look at financial networks today, <coughs> they are very reminiscent of email before the internet, right? And in pre-internet mail, what happened was you wanted to send a message to someone, and that message might have to be routed through a whole bunch of different UUCP nodes that would basically call each other up on modems when they had uh, messages for each other, and there's also BitNet and a bunch of other things. Uh, email addresses look looked something like this. You had these bang paths where you had like a series of hosts followed by a username and these path names then of course were not globally meaningful because you had to start from the first host had to be someplace that you could reach. Um, and of course now we have something much better. Anyone can email anyone. And so what we're focused on at Stellar is answering the question, can we make sending money as easy as it is today to send internet mail? And the first observation is that this would be possible if we had a global ledger. So the same as Wells Fargo can easily transfer money between two customers of Wells Fargo. What if we had a global ledger that let this bank in China, you know, send $150 to, to my bank here? Uh, that would be great, except who's going to manage that kind of ledger, right? Unfortunately, there's a lot of power to be able to decide exactly how much money every bank in the world has. And there's no single party that's, you know, trusted enough to play that kind of role. So what can we do? Well, uh, as Stella, we kind of drew inspiration from another global system that seems to work really well and yet doesn't have any kind of centralized, uh, uh, any, at least uh, de facto, uh, uh, doesn't have any centralized control, inherently centralized control, and that is internet routing, right? So the internet works pretty well, but there is no single party that manages the internet, right? The internet arose out of a series of pairwise peering and transit relationships that different uh, ISPs have with each other and with other autonomous systems. Um, and yet that's somehow good enough to get this global system that works pretty well. So the idea behind the work I'm gonna present is let's use pairwise trust to achieve secure global consensus and then we'll use this global kind of internet level consensus to realize a global ledger that can make moving uh, money all around the world much easier. Okay, now uh, why consensus? Well, consensus turns out to be the key to replication, right? If you want to replicate data so that all the banks know how much, you know, they, everybody has, uh, you've got to keep all those copies in sync, right? And, and a very common way to do this is to use what's called replicated state machines, where you s start off in a situation where all, all replicas agree on the initial state of the system, and then all the replicas are going to agree on a deterministic sequence of operations that happen. So, you know, operation seven here, might be, you know, this bank in China sending me uh, $150. So number one is easy, right? Everybody starts off in the same initial state. Number two is what requires consensus, right? It means before we consider any payment to have uh, gone through, we actually need to wait for there to be consensus among the replicas that, in fact, you know, Operation 7 was me getting this, this $150. Okay, so 
For the next part of the talk, I'm just going to give a background on Byzantine agreement, which is previous work, uh, but is, it, you have to understand that to understand the generalization that I'll present later. So in, in part one, uh, it will not be decentralized and it will not solve this problem, but it's kind of necessary background. Then I'll talk about this new model for, uh, for Byzantine agreement, federated Byzantine agreement, that can actually grow like the internet in this organic decentralized way. And finally, I'll present a construction SCP, the Stellar Consensus Protocol of uh, FBA. Is there any way we could get a little less volume in the, I'm getting a little bit of feedback, I think. Um, so if we could, we could turn down the speakers just slightly, it would be good. Okay, so Byzantine Agreement is, uh, <coughs> is a way of achieving consensus. Let's start with uh, a, a more detailed discussion of what is the consensus problem. Well, the goal in consensus is for a bunch of distributed agents to agree on some particular output value. So each agent in the consensus problem starts with a value. Here we've got, you know, three, nine, and seven. And uh, typically this value would be a candidate for the nth operation that you're going to apply to some replicated state machine. Uh, of course, the agents might have different inputs, and it's fine to uh, just pick any one of them. Um, and so then what happens is the agents are going to exchange a bunch of messages following some consensus protocol, and they'll use the protocol to choose one of the, an, an output value. In this case, let's say they choose 9 because it was V2's input. That's fine. Once they've chosen 9, they can all output that value. And the important point about a consensus protocol is once you've output that value, uh, you can never change your mind, right? Because people might take irreversible actions in response to these output values, right? Like ATM machines might spit out a bunch of bills and you can't then say, oops, actually that transfer was, that operation was something else. That person didn't have $150, right? Okay, so there's some properties you might like to have of your consensus protocol. So one, uh, we'll say that a consensus protocol provides safety if it has two properties, agreement and validity. Agreement means that all outputs have to be the same. Uh, and, you know, that makes sense because if different, no, different agents output different values, then you don't really have consensus, do you? Um, and the second is validity, which says the output has to match at least one of the input values. And without validity, there's a pretty trivial solution. You know, everyone always outputs zero. Like, yeah, everyone will agree. It's just not a very interesting system. Okay, second, we'll say that a consensus protocol provides liveness um, if it has termination, which means that eventually non, all the non-faulty agents are going to output a value. And finally, we'll say that a consensus protocol has fault tolerance if it can recover from an agent failing at any point in the execution of the protocol. And in fact, uh, well, consensus systems are, are uh, kind of categorized into two fault tolerance models. We can talk about fail stop protocols that handle agents that crash, they just basically stop sending messages. And then there are also Byzantine fault tolerant protocols that handle arbitrary agent behavior. So there, when an agent fails, it starts acting in the worst possible way. Like basically you can model, think of an attacker taking over the agent and purposely sending the worst possible messages to try to, to hurt the system. Now, there's this seminal result in distributed systems due to Fisher, Lynch, and Patterson, uh, which is called the FLP impossibility result which says that no deterministic consensus protocol can guarantee all three of safety, liveness, and fault tolerance in an asynchronous system. So uh, <clears throat> for the next few slides, I want to give you an intuition for why this might actually be impossible. If you think back to a couple of slides ago, we had these three, uh, we had these three agents, uh, and they exchanged a bunch of messages and output the value 9, right? But let's say that uh, there'd been some uh, network outage uh, when the system started, and V2 was cut off from the other two nodes. So now V1 and V3, they can't talk to V2, so they might say, well, V2 uh, might have failed. And if the, in an asynchronous system, you can't tell the difference between someone who's temporarily unreachable and a, and a node that's failed. So if the protocol is fault tolerant, V1 and V3 are going to have to be able to terminate on their own. And, uh, and so since they don't know what V2's input value is, because they can't talk to it, they'll have to pick one of theirs. So let's say they pick 7 and they output 7. Right? And then, of course, at some point, the network may come back, and if, assuming the protocol uh, satisfies agreement, then uh, V2 is actually going to have to output 7 as well so that it uh, agrees with the other two nodes. So what we see here is that uh, the output value chosen by the nodes actually depended on the behavior of the network. Right? In the first case, they output 9, but then a node was s slower to talk to a particular node, so they ended up out outputting 7. Um, and so when a system is in that kind of state, we'll say that it's, it's in a bivalent state, right? A bivalent state means that the, the particular output value chosen is going to depend on what happens with the network. 
Conversely, uh, you can have a system where the fate is already sealed and there's only one possible output value. Uh, and then we'll say that the system is univalent. And if that only possible output value is I, we'll say that the system is I-valent. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, you hope this doesn't happen, but if you're maybe your consensus protocol isn't very good, you can end up in a stuck state where there are actually one or more non-faulty nodes that will never be able to output a value. Okay, now if you think back, uh, we said that the output was right once, right? You can, an agent can never change its mind about the, the output, and all the outputs have to agree, right? So that means that no output is possible while the system, if, assuming you have agreement, your system is safe, no output is gonna be possible while you're in a bivalent state. Right, so if your execution starts in a bivalent state and then eventually terminates, at some point it must have transitioned to a univalent state when the when you know it became clear what what the output value uh, was going to be for everyone. So, um, so here's kind of the intuition behind this FLP result. Consider a terminating execution of a bivalent system. Right, so you have a system and it, it's going to run and everyone's going to output all the non-faulty nodes are going to output a value. And let's say that M was the very last message that was received in a bivalent state. So receiving M somehow flipped the system from uh, bivalent to univalent. We'll call M the deciding message, right? Because receiving M is what de decided the fate of the system. Obviously any terminating execution is gonna require a, a, a deciding message. Now suppose instead that we kind of rewind a little bit and the network had delayed this message M so that in fact M didn't get delivered when it originally got delivered, but a bunch of other messages got delivered first. Well, it could be the case that by the time M gets delivered, once it gets delivered late, it's no longer going to be a deciding message, right? It, because other things have happened, so M is no longer as relevant as it was before. And in this case, we say that M has been neutralized. So here's kind of the sketch of, of the FLP proof. Um, first of all, there, you can show that there are bivalent starting configurations. Second of all, if your system has fault tolerance, then that means that the network can neutralize any deciding message. Why? Well, because intuitively, um, if you're sitting there waiting for some deciding message, it could be that whoever sent that actually failed. So you can't wait forever. You have to make progress with messages from other nodes. And because the system's bivalent, you know, that progress could go in either direction. Um, and therefore, uh, M is, is no longer gonna be, gonna be relevant uh, at that point. Um, and so therefore, what can happen is that your system can basically remain bivalent in perpetuity. Whenever you're about to, whenever you send a deciding message, the network, you know, delays just that one message long enough for it to be neutralized, and then by the time it's delivered, it's no longer interesting. Okay, so, so that's FLP, uh, and that's just a, a fact of life, and yet I told you in the beginning that uh, you know, real systems need replication and replication needs consensus. And, and so this is, uh, so, so consensus is, is important. What can we do? There are a couple of things we can do. So one thing we can do is notice that FLP is specifically for deterministic algorithms. So we can actually randomize uh, the, uh, the algorithm to bypass the result. Now the downside is that um, these randomized algorithms uh, they tend to take uh, a, a long time to complete. So for example, uh, they might terminate with probability one, but the expected number of rounds might be, you know, like exponential in the number of nodes, for example, which is not, um, not super attractive. Now, it doesn't have to be that way. There are ways to improve on that uh, using fancy crypto, but then the fancy crypto sometimes has assumptions that maybe are a little bit awkward. Like it's very common is that you assume that there's a trusted dealer who set the thing up in the first place. And that might be awkward if, if, you, if there is no, good party to play the trusted dealer. Okay, so the other thing you can notice is that FLP is for asynchronous systems. So what you could do is you can instead assume synchrony, right? Say like, okay, if some node doesn't reply, uh, you know, takes too long to reply, then we just assume that that node has failed. And ideally what you do is you, you structure your system such that only liveness and not safety rests on this assumption. So if you got it wrong, and in fact the node was alive and it just took too long, well then you can try again by increasing your timeout and you know, it, it, you know, so that eventually you can, uh, you can terminate in practice. So that's kind of the, the general plan, right? You wanna devise protocols that terminate in practice unless the network has some truly pathological behavior. And the key property to make sure that's the case is you have to avoid stuck states, right? A, a consensus protocol that has stuck states is extremely bad because once you get in a stuck state, there is no hope. You will never terminate at that point. Okay, so, um, so let's make our first stab at implementing a, a consensus protocol. 
Um, and this will be kind of a straw man, uh, but it'll be useful nonetheless. So suppose you have a system with n nodes, and let's furthermore assume that you have uh, fail stop behavior to make things simple. We're now gonna pick some quorum size t that is greater than n over two. So t is gonna be more than, than half the nodes in the system. And we're gonna have the nodes vote for values. And we're gonna say that uh, if a quorum ever unanimously votes for some particular value, then we're gonna output that value, right? So in this example up here, um, you see that uh, quorum A has unanimously voted for the value nine. So when you see that, it becomes okay to output the value nine, right? And the key, the key idea here is that because the quorum size is greater than half, and because uh, any, two, any two quorums will intersect in at least one node, and because nodes aren't allowed to change their votes, uh, you know, there'll be a, at most one value that receives a quorum. Okay, so why isn't this a good solution to the consensus pro problem? Well, because we have stuck states, right? So yeah, we got lucky and everybody in quorum A voted for nine, but it could be that everybody voted for all different values and so no value gets a majority. Uh, it could also be the case that uh, you know, nine did get a majority, but then after voting for nine, some of the one or more of the nodes failed and so now some nodes might know that nine got a majority, but other nodes might not be able to, might not hear that message and might not know that nine in fact got a quorum. So, uh, so, so this isn't, so voting is not a solution to the consensus problem, but it is kind of a useful building block. So let's think about what we actually got from voting here, right? We started in some, some bivalent state. Then we uh, uh, had a bunch of votes for some value, like say nine, and when you have enough votes, uh, then suddenly other values become impossible. So systems avalent. Um, and then if we got really lucky and kind of everybody ended up voting for A, uh, then uh, the whole system can agree on A. But there's a danger that either through node failure or through split votes that you end up in this stuck state, right? So what this means is you definitely do not want to vote directly on the question that you really care about. Like if you vote on operation seven is or is not a credit of $150 to my account, well then if that gets stuck, we'll never know how much money is in my account because like we never, we, we can never reach agreement on that point. So, so what kind of statement is it actually uh, safe to vote on? There's actually two cases. Um, first of all, suppose there's a value where all correct nodes are gonna vote identically on this question, right? So this is like a, a Soviet election, right? There's only one person on the ballot and you have to learn who's on the ballot, but then once you do, that's the only way you can vote, right? So we'll call that an irrefutable statement. Um, and the other, uh, the other kind of statement that's okay to vote on is a neutralizable statement. In other words, the statement where it, if you voted for it in time, it might've helped you reach consensus, but if it gets delayed, there's some way to neutralize the, neutralize its effect on the question you actually care about uh, so you can then go on to, to make progress by voting on some other question. So a, a key question in consensus is how do you formulate useful yet uh, neutralizable statements? Uh, and there are actually two ways of doing this that uh, people have come up with. One is this uh, view-based approach, um, which is actually, if you can use it, uh, probably better and, and simpler. Um, and uh, like, for example, some of you may have heard of Raft, which is a, a popular uh, consensus algorithm that, that uses a, a basically uses a view-based approach and it's a nice, uh, nicely comprehensible uh, protocol. Unfortunately, the view-based approach doesn't quite work in, the, in what I'm gonna present later on today. So the other way of doing it is uh, through a ballot-based uh, system. And this is something that was introduced by Paxos. So in, in Paxos, or at least in the, in the variant of Paxos that I'm gonna present that's designed to make the rest of the talk uh, make sense. Um, your nodes are gonna vote to commit or abort uh, individual ballots, and the two are contradictory. So you can't vote both to commit and abort a ballot. You have to pick one or the other. And a ballot is gonna consist of a pair, uh, n comma x, where n is some counter, just to ensure you can keep incrementing it and get more ballots, and x is gonna be a candidate uh, consensus value for, for you to, to output. And if a quorum ever votes to commit n comma x for any value n, then it's gonna be safe to output x, right? So that's what we're trying to do. Now, uh, there's an important invariant uh, here, which is that all committed and all stuck ballots have to have the same value x. So in order to preserve this invariant, you cannot vote to commit a ballot until you first prepared the ballot. Now, what does it mean to prepare the ballot? We'll say that a ballot uh, n comma x is prepared when 
every statement, uh, when every incompatible ballot with a different value uh, that has a counter N or lower uh, has been aborted, right? In other words, uh, because you know everything less than it is aborted, you know that any, any lower numbered ballots uh, that are either stuck or committed have to have the same value. And it's fine if you commit two ballots that have the same value because either way, you're gonna output the same value. So typically, instead of individually voting to abort a bunch of ballots, there's like some prepare message that encodes a whole set of aborts, but conceptually what's happening is you're aborting uh, a, a range of ballots, right? And you can see that this ballot technique gives you neutralization because if there's some ballot n comma x that's stuck, you can neutralize it by just restarting with a higher numbered ballot, you know, n plus one comma x, right? And the definition of prepared is, is carefully crafted such that, uh, you know, even if n comma x is stuck, n plus one comma x can still be prepared, can still be considered prepared. Does that make sense? Okay, so, uh, so far we've been in the fail stop model. What happens if now uh, nodes might experience Byzantine failure and start outputting malicious messages? Well, the, the problem in a, the, or the complication from Byzantine failure is that now nodes that have failed are allowed to change their votes, right? Or not they're allowed to, but they will break the rules and they will change their votes, right? So uh, what this means is that um, we want two quorums to intersect, not just at a node, but that at an honest node. So in order for the system to be safe, if kind of the, the minimum quorum overlap, in this case is 2t minus n, right? Uh, out of 2t minus n nodes, at least one of those had better be honest. So that means that uh, in order to guarantee safety, the largest number of Byzantine failures we can tolerate is going to be 2t minus n minus 1, okay? And we'll call that value fs because it's kind of the, the failure threshold for safety. You can tolerate fs failures and still guarantee safety, right? Um, now, what about liveness? Well, in order to have liveness, you actually need to have a quorum, right? Because if you don't have a quorum, you'll never be able to vote successfully on everything. What's the, mo the largest number of failures you can tolerate and still have a quorum? Well, it's going to be n minus t, right? There are n nodes. Uh, if n minus t fail, you still have t left, so you still have a quorum left, right? So we'll call the, uh, the, the liveness failure threshold, FL, uh, n minus t, okay? Now, there are long-standing practical protocols that exist for, uh, for Byzantine agreement uh, in, in this kind of setting. And typically, they set n to be 3f plus 1 uh, and t to be 2f plus 1 for some integer f. And that's kind of the equilibrium point at which the failure threshold fs and the liveness threshold fl uh, are the same. Um, and, uh, but, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. You could you'd have different failure thresholds for safety and liveness. Okay, so, uh, so this is the picture of, of what you get from a vote. We know how to uh, reason about voting when some of the nodes may have experienced Byzantine failure. Uh, so now a question is, how do you know when your, your vote is done, right? So, you know, at some point, if enough people voted for some value, uh, the system may become avalent, uh, and you know that you got there basically if you saw a quorum. If you saw a quorum vote for something, well then you know that no other value could pop. You, it still might not succeed because nodes might fail before everybody hears about the votes, but you know no other value um, is, going to, uh, is going to get a majority. Um, and, uh, and then eventually you'd like to get to the point where you know that all the non-faulty nodes are actually gonna learn that this vote succeeded. So how do we know we've done this? Well, um, if you think back to the previous slide, uh, we said that the failure, th uh, the safety failure threshold, FS, was 2t uh, minus n minus 1. Now, if you add 1 to that, you get 2t minus n. That is the overlap of two quorums. Suppose that FS plus 1 nodes all fail. And I write evil here because now they've not just failed crash, they're actually sending out malicious messages. Those nodes can now say one thing to the rest of quorum A and something else to the rest of quorum B, and they can cause the, the system to, to lose uh, agreement, basically. So if all these nodes in the middle here are malicious, you know, the whole system has failed. So now suppose that you have uh, FS plus one nodes that unanimously tell you that they saw a quorum vote for value A. Well, either you're completely hosed or at least one of these nodes is honest, so you might as well trust it and believe that actually the system voted for A. So at that point, you can actually assume A with no loss of safety, right? Now, 
uh, of course, you could still lose liveness, but suppose that you kind of extend this a bit and you get to a point where f of fl plus fs plus one nodes, uh, which happens to be the, quor uh, the quorum size t, all make the same assertion that they've, uh, they've seen an honest node, uh, th th that they've seen a vote succeed for A. Well, at that point, one of two things could happen. You could have, whoops, you could have um, more than f of l nodes fail, at which point the system's not guaranteed to have liveness anyway, right? So you could get stuck, but that's, that's just life. Or if FL or fewer nodes fail, well then they're gonna be at least FS plus one nodes remaining. And you know those nodes are gonna continue to claim that uh, they saw a vote for A. So those nodes can convince the rest of the system. So this means once you see a quorum, once you see T nodes say that, that a vote succeeded, you know that eventually either the system's completely hosed or all the nodes will, will agree on this eventually. Well, that's uh, very useful to have. Okay, questions so far before we get to the new stuff. Okay, so, uh, so now we're gonna talk about federated Byzantine agreement. It's called federated because that's kind of the expected use case that we have, but you could also think of it as generalized Byzantine agreement, right? This is gonna be Byzantine agreement, but where we don't magically bless N nodes as like VN nodes in the system. So the main idea behind uh, this federated Byzantine agreement is that we're gonna determine quorums in a decentralized way. Every node V in the system is gonna pick one or more quorum slices um, and where a quorum slice is basically a set of nodes that's sufficient to, to convince V that, that some statement is, is true, right? So another way to think about it is a, you need a quorum to decide a statement, but this uh, particular node slice is the subset of that quorum that was necessary to convince that one particular node. So now we can define what a federated Byzantine agreement system is, or an FBAS. So a federated Byzantine ag agreement system is gonna be a set of nodes, V, and some quorum function, Q, where for any node little v, Q of v is gonna specify the set of slices that were chosen by node v. And given this quorum function, we can now define what a quorum is. A quorum is gonna be some set of nodes that contains at least one slice of each of its members, right? So it's gonna be able to satisfy every one of its members is going to believe that it's a quorum because the quorum is gonna contain a slice uh, chosen by that node. So this is really kind of the, the key definition in the model. So let's kind of zoom in on this definition of quorum and look at a couple of examples. So uh, to make things simple, we're gonna start off with uh, each node only having a single quorum slice, right? And that's gonna let us visualize the quorum slice with arrows. So basically, um, if node V1 here depends on V2 and V3, we'll put arrows from V1 to V2 and V3. Right, so now if you look at these dependencies, we can see that V2, V3, and V4 form a quorum. Why? Because V2, V3, V4 is actually a slice for each of its members, V2, V3, and V4. Therefore, each member is satisfied. Therefore, uh, this is a valid quorum. Now, if we look at V1, uh, let's look at the set V1, V2, V3. Well, that is a slice for V1, but it's not a slice for V2. Basically, V1 is saying, well, I'll agree to something if V2 and V3 agree. And V2 says, well, I'll agree, but only if you know, V3 and V4 agree. So because V2 is not gonna agree to something without uh, V4's consent, um, there's no way that without V4, just the first three nodes are gonna be able to agree to anything, right? Um, and in fact, the smallest quorum that contains V1 is actually the set of all nodes in this particular example, uh, v V1, V2, V3, V4, okay? So this is kind of a toy example. Let's look at maybe a little bit uh, more realistic example of the kind of usage that we expect. And that is to have a kind of tiered uh, quorum slice structure. So let's say that we have uh, a kind of a top tier that's maybe uh, you know, analogous to, 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 to like tier one ISPs on the internet, right? And they, maybe there are four of them and, and they all require three out of the four uh, other big uh, nodes to, uh, to agree in this thing. Uh, and then maybe there's a middle tier in which these nodes depend, each of the middle tier nodes depends on like two out of the top four tier nodes. And then there's a leaf tier, V9, V10 here, where these guys only depend on, on the middle tier. Um, so this is a lot like the internet, right? Where you've got these tier one ISPs and then you have regional ISPs are, are, are pairing with those uh, and so on. And the nice thing about this is that 
uh, you know, even though the, the top tier nodes are very important, nobody has magically anointed those, right? They have uh, earned that power by virtue of their important role in, uh, in the network, right? So, you know, in the case of a financial network, the market might decide that, say, like the top four biggest banks or like, you know, or, you know, dozen biggest banks, it could be larger, it's just for the purposes of the slide, the, the numbers are small, constitutes a top tier, right? Um, but what's nice is that the market decided this, and not only that, but you don't need to have unanimous agreement, you just need to have like, you know, pretty, uh, a large amount of overlap between what people consider like the really important institutions, right? Um, and not only that, but you can actually get increased safety. So let's say that V7 and V8 here don't like this at all. They're like, well, you know, screw this. Like these big banks, I realize that like I need to interact with them to get by in life, but like I don't trust them as, you know, any further than I can throw them. And I think they're gonna like, screw me over like the first opportunity they get. So what can you do in that situation? Well, maybe there are some, you know, smaller nonprofits who kind of step up and say like, we're willing to, you know, also uh, play a role in this consensus. And so maybe V7 and V8 now, in addition to depending on the big banks, they're also gonna require that one of these small nonprofits agree to uh, that, that any transaction be settled. And the nonprofits are gonna kind of depend on one another uh, to, to increase interdependency, right? And so now let's say that in fact V7 and V8 were right to be paranoid and you know, Citibank gives, pays V7 a billion dollars, you know, and V7 waits for that to settle and you know, that's fine. And then Citibank illegally tries to double spend that billion dollars and also send it to V8. Well, at that point, V8 is gonna say, uh, wait a sec, I'm not gonna accept that billion dollars until one of these nonprofits has signed off. And the nonprofits are gonna depend on each other and they're gonna say like, oh no, we, we can't sign off on this, we don't agree because that billion dollars already belongs to V7, right? So this shows how, uh, how you know, even despite the importance of the big players here, um, other smaller players can help keep them honest, which is a, an important part of this model. Okay, so one of the big differences between federated Byzantine agreement and regular Byzantine agreement uh, is that in federated Byzantine agreement, failure is really a per node concept, right? In, in regular Byzantine agreement, before we were saying that either you know, the whole system failed or because or, uh, there wasn't agreement or you know, everything worked. In federated Byzantine agreement, well, on the, you're gonna have several kinds of failures. So on the left, of course, you have ill-behaved nodes. These are the Byzantine failures, the nodes that they've either crashed or they've been taken over by an attacker. And then you have well-behaved nodes. And well-behaved nodes, you know, ideally they're correct, but some of them might actually be blocked. They might lose liveness. So at least they haven't believed transactions that they shouldn't have believed, but they stop being able to make progress on new transactions. And then of course, the worst would be to have nodes that are actually divergent. They believe things that the rest of the world doesn't believe. Um, but the thing is, you could have some nodes be divergent because they chose bad quorum slices and yet the rest of the world could continue to operate properly. Okay, so the next question is, where should we set the goalposts, right? Obviously, we would like to have you know, as many nodes as possible be correct, other than the ill-behaved nodes that we have, have no control over. Um, so, you know, when is it, when should we just give up on safety and decide that it's completely impossible? Well, here's kind of a simple example. Suppose your quorum slices are such that there are two entirely disjoint quorums, like this is quorum on the left and this quorum on the right. Because they're never gonna exchange messages and they don't depend on each other, of course they're gonna be able to agree on, on contradictory things, right? Um, so basically what this means is, uh, is you need what I'll call quorum intersection, right? Where every two quorums need to share at least one node, otherwise there's no hope of, of having safety. All right, so let's try to fix this by throwing them some node V7 and saying, okay, everybody now is gonna depend on, uh, on V7, right? And so now we have quorum intersection, but suppose V7 turns out to be malicious, right? Well now V7 can say one thing to the nodes on the left, something else to the nodes on the right, and you know, uh, at that point, uh, the two sides of the picture are gonna be driven to divergent states. And again, we won't have agreement, we'll have lost uh, consensus. So we kinda need to revise this, this um, quorum intersection property and say that in order to have any hope of delivering safety, it has to be the case that we have quorum intersection 
after we delete all the uh, ill-behaved malicious nodes, right? And if we delete node V7 from both, you know, the set of nodes and from everyone's quorum slice, what we can see is that this picture starts to look a lot like the picture on the last slide, right? We basically have two totally separate quorums that don't have intersection. And yeah, so of course it's obvious that it's hopeless and we'll never have safety. Okay, well what about liveness? So now suppose you have a kind of a three out of four setup here, just to keep things simple. And suppose two out of these nodes have, have failed, right? Well, now if you think about what V1's quorum slices are, well, V1, one of V1's quorum slices is V2, V3, V1, V2, V3, also V1, V2, V4, V1, V3, V4. Any slice you pick of V1's is going to contain one of these failed nodes, right? So V1 is, doesn't have any slices that don't include a failed node. Uh, and so if that's the case, obviously V1 is, is, can't be guaranteed progress because the failed nodes might just never uh, answer requests. So if there's a set like this, like V3, V4, that intersects every single one of a node V's quorum slices, then we're gonna say that that set is V blocking. So in this case, V3, V4 is V blocking for V1. It's also V blocking for V2. Um, if, 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 a set of, if the set of failed nodes is V blocking for some node V, then there's no hope that V itself is gonna have liveness, right? You just can't guarantee that because you don't know the failed nodes, you can't count on them to behave properly. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so basically suppose U is some set of well-behaved nodes in, in an, an FBAS system, right? Now, uh, if, if, you're, if, you wanna, if you wanna achieve optimal safety, then the FBAS should guarantee safety for the nodes in U as long as U enjoys quorum intersection after you delete uh, all the nodes that are not in you, right? So basically you wanna say like, if you is well behaved, then we want it, to, want, it, want it to work, right? So basically delete all the nodes that aren't in you. If you still have quorum intersection, then you're good. Now, uh, if you want any hope of making progress, if you wanna avoid stuck states uh, for nodes in you, then it had better be the case that you is a quorum. Because if you is a not, if it's not a quorum, then it, it can't actually make progress without depending on some nodes that are not in you. So basically, we're gonna say that a node is intact if it's in a set U that satisfies these two properties, one and two, right? That it's possible to have safety and it's possible to have um, freedom from stuck states. And uh, you know, there's actually a theorem in, in the, 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 the white paper that goes along with this talk that quorum intersection implies there's one maximal set of intact nodes U. So that's kind of convenient because you can start from uh, noticing if there's quorum intersection and say like, yeah, just talk about the set of intact nodes. Even if you don't know what it is, because you don't know who's failed, at least you can reason about the set of intact nodes having certain properties. Okay, questions before we get to the construction. Um, yeah, so the question is, can an FBAS guarantee that there will always be safety and that there will always be liveness? Well, you can definitely guarantee that there will always be safety. You can't guarantee liveness uh, exactly because of the FLP uh, result. Um, you know, what you can do is you can guarantee freedom from stuck states and, you know, maybe you could also do, do better than that and say like, well, it'll, it'll, it'll terminate in, in practice. Um, there, you know, I'll show you one SCP, uh, one in construction which is deterministic. So there could be other constructions that, for example, are randomized and, and can terminate with probability one, which would be uh, which would be interesting to know about. The one I'll show you um, is going to, you know, have some synchrony assumptions basically. Um, so yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, so now I'm gonna tell you about the Stellar Consensus Protocol, SCP. And so this is the first general FBA protocol. And it's also uh, a protocol that's, uh, that is now in, in use by the Stellar Payment Network. And uh, SCP basically guarantees safety and prevents stuck states for all intact nodes in the system. And it does uh, one better, it also guarantees safety for well-behaved nodes that enjoy quorum intersection, even if those nodes aren't intact, right? So it, in a sense, it achieves optimal safety. And the key idea in SCP is this technique of federated voting, right? The idea of nodes exchanging vote messages and uh, every vote now includes a quorum slice. And therefore, as you're counting votes, you can kind of dynamically assemble the, a quorum and figure out if a quorum has been reached on a statement. Okay, so how does this work? Well, uh, in, a, in an FBAS system, a node V can vote for a statement 
A as long as, you know, it decides that A is valid and doesn't, you know, contradict uh, something that the node's already accepted. Uh, and also, the node can't have voted for something contradicting A and has to promise that, it, well, now that it's voted for A, it can never, you know, vote for something that, that contradicts A. So <coughs> when, uh, when you have a, a quorum that uh, unanimously votes for some statement A, we'll say that the quorum has ratified A, right? And similarly, if there's a node that's in a quorum and that quorum has ratified A, then we'll also say that the node has, has ratified this statement A. So you can show that because uh, that, that basically, if you have quorum intersection of well-behaved nodes, then, uh, th then well-behaved nodes can never ratify two contradictory statements, right? And that follows from the fact that the quorums intersect and if they intersect at honest nodes, those honest nodes can't change their votes. Now, uh, there's a problem, the same problem we ran into before, an intact node V might be unable to ratify some statement A after other nodes have ratified it. So we could still run into this stuck state uh, situation, right? Why? Because V might have voted against A or because some nodes might have voted for A and then might have failed. So we're left with kind of the same picture that we had before in this centralized system here, right? Um, we need a way to agree on a statement even after nodes have voted against it or after there have been some failures. Uh, and, we, and, and then we need to kind of know that we've reached that point. So could we maybe apply the same technique that we had before? Remember before we said, hey, if the intersection of two quorums unanimously says, hey, we've seen this value uh, supported by a quorum, uh, then we accept that because, you know, otherwise the whole system would have failed, right? Uh, well, we actually can't do that anymore because now failure is not a whole system property, it's a per node property, right? Uh, so this premise that the whole system can't fail uh, no longer holds. So in this case, let's say that you do see these nodes Vn minus T to Vt saying this. Vn could hear this and it's going to say, well, you know, actually I don't care. Um, yeah, it sucks that like there's this intersection with quorum A is like entirely consists of these nodes that are saying this, uh, but you know, for all I know quorum A is like some bogus civil attack or something, right? Like. Like, I don't, it's not my problem if quorum A fails. Like, I want to, you know, if I still have quorum intersection with the good nodes, like, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to accept something just because other nodes might have failed. So, uh, we need a different approach. So, uh, so what we're going to do uh, is we're going to uh, have a notion of accepting a statement that's a little bit weaker than, than what we had before in the centralized case. We're going to say that a node uh, accepts some statement A that's, you know, consistent with everything else that the node has said and, and, and decided. Um, if one of two things happens, so first of all, there could be a quorum that contains V in which all the nodes either voted for the statement A or have already accepted A, so that's good. That kind of means you've ratified it or, uh, or wh whatever, either way, or, or you have a quorum, so some other way. Second, this is the, the new part, if every member of some v-blocking set claims to accept A, then A is also going to accept it. Now, the second condition here provides nodes a way to accept statements after that they've already voted against. Um, now, why should this be reasonable? Well, the intuition here is, let's say that there's a v-blocking set that claims to accept some statement. Well, either all those nodes are lying, uh, which means the node is not intact, or a quorum has actually accepted A. So, in fact, uh, you know, we show in the paper that two intact nodes can't accept contradictory statements. Uh, so far, so good, uh, but we still have two problems. One is that there's still no guarantee that all intact nodes can accept a statement, right? So there's some way that you can accept a statement after voting against it, but there might be statements that you still can't accept, right? Um, and the second is, is even worse, that, that because we've w weakened this notion of accepting by adding the second condition, um, you could actually end up with nodes that have quorum intersection but are not intact that would accept contradictory statements. And that we really don't want to do, right? Because we're trying to achieve optimal safety. And kind of intuitively, the reason this is happening is that a V-blocking set is kind of analogous to like a set of size FL plus one, like a set that would cost you liveness. And what we really wanted was a, a, a set of size FS plus one. We wanted to know like, hey, like, like, if, if one of these nodes has failed in this, if, if all of these nodes have failed, then we've lost safety. So since they're all telling me something, I, might as, I can assume it's true without losing safety. But we can't do that. There's no equivalent of FS in, in this federated system. So, um, so the solution here is to hold a second vote 
on the fact that the first vote succeeded, right? So, uh, so basically, we're going to call this confirmation. We'll say that a quorum confirms a statement when it, ra it confirms a statement A. When it ratifies a statement, we accepted A, right? And similarly, a node that's in a quorum that that confirms a statement will uh, will say that that node confirms a statement. So, this solves the second problem with suboptimal safety because now we have straight up ratification. Ratification, right? The nodes are, uh, you know, every node in the quorum needs to vote on this. There's no weird second way to confirm something. You have to uh, have an affirmative quorum, all, all saying they accepted it. Um, it also, as it happens, solves problem one uh, of intact nodes unable to accept. And why? Well, if you think back to when we talked about voting, we said there are actually two kinds of statement that are uh, reasonable to vote on. You can vote on a neutralizable statement, or you can vote on an irrefutable statement. So because we have proved that two intact nodes will never accept contradictory statements, uh, the fact that statement A was accepted is actually irrefutable. So, uh, you know, the correct nodes are going to vote for that statement uh, and they're never going to have voted for something else that prevents them from actually confirming the statement. So we can have the second vote and not worry about uh, losing liveness, right? And in fact, the, we can show that once a single intact node has confirmed a statement, all other intact nodes will eventually confirm it, you know, as long as, you know, enough messages get delivered. Okay, so this has now left us with the following picture, right? You start, uh, you're trying to determine whether A or not A is true. You start in some uncommitted state. Um, and then if, you know, A is valid, you might vote for A or you might, you know, get it wrong and vote for not A. Um, then uh, if you voted for A, you might ratify A. Um, if you didn't vote for A, you might see a v-blocking set uh, except A. Uh, and at that point, you accept A. However, you, don't, you still can't assume A for safety. However, you hold the second uh, confirmation vote, and once a quorum affirmatively confirms A, then <coughs> you can assume A without loss of uh, either safety or liveness. Okay, so now all we have to do is turn this federated voting into a consensus protocol. And the consensus protocol is going to be a lot like the version of Paxos that, that I presented before, right? So we're going to have ballots that are of the form n comma x, where x is the candidate consensus value. If you vote to commit n comma x, where voting now means you pass the confirmation stage, then uh, you choose x as the value. Um, uh, we're going to have the same invariant that all committed and stuck ballots uh, have to have the same x. To prepare a ballot, you have to prepare a ballot before voting on it. To prepare a ballot, you have to say that all the kind of all the lower incompatible ballots have been aborted. Um, so that gives you this out of neutralizing a ballot by moving to a higher ballot that has a, a higher counter but the same value, even if the even if the previous ballot was was stuck. So uh, this actually gets you consensus. There's one other problem, which is, well, how do you actually pick values to stick in your ballots in the first place? And it would be a little annoying if everybody stuck different values, you might end up with a system not, not converging either. So, uh, so there's also in Stellar this decentralized nomination protocol in which a bunch of nodes uh, nominate values uh, and then you kind of combine the nominated values in a deterministic way. And what's cool here is that there's no way to vote against nominating a value. You can kind of withhold your vote, but uh, never vote against nominating something. So that means nomination, once again, is irrefutable. So what happens is you, you nominate values until such point as there's a value that's confirmed nominated, then you stop nominating new values. There might be some old values that percolate through the system, but eventually the, the system will converge on the set of values. You don't know when that convergence happens, um, but that's why the balloting protocol is there. If you kick off your balloting too early, um, the balloting will prevent you from uh, violating agreement. Okay, so this protocol SCP has, uh, has four really desirable properties, right? So first of all, it is decentralized, right? It is in, in the sense that the internet is decentralized. Um, it has pretty had low latency compared to kind of like the, the time scales we're talking about for sending money, right? It, you know, we can complete it in the amount of time you wait for a credit card swipe at the checkout counter. Um, it has completely flexible trust, right? You know, we might have, uh, you know, the EFF or Stellar keeping much larger banks honest in the system. Um, and uh, finally, it has, you know, asymptotic security, meaning that it just depends on cryptographic hashes and digital signatures. So you can pick an arbitrarily powerful attacker, and, you know, like every grain on the si of sand on the planet is a supercomputer trying to crack your thing, and you know, okay, just pick 128-bit uh, security and, and then you're good. 
Okay, so there's some other, so previous Byzantine agreement basically had these at last three properties, but the, it lacked decentralized control. Um, proof of work has this decentralized control, which is fantastic. It's not as good in the other categories. This uh, proof of stake is, is uh, depending on which version, uh, has some of these benefits, but, uh, but not all of them. So, uh, so this is great. Now it's probably worth also pointing out that consensus is not the same thing as a cryptocurrency. So SCP does not you know, offer some way to mint coins. It doesn't provide any intrinsic incentives for good behavior, right? We assume all the incentives are extrinsic, like your reputation depends on this. It also doesn't tell you whom to trust, so uh, there are clearly some bad configurations where you end up with disjoint quorums uh, or not sufficient overlap between the quorums. So, you know, it works well if you can configure it right, and it works badly uh, if you don't. Um, but what's interesting is that SCP, uh, we think, has applications beyond financial networks, and so I want to just highlight one of those, uh, which is uh, accountability for certificate authorities. So we have this problem right now where there are dozens and dozens of root CAs in your browser, and basically any one of those can completely mess you up by signing bad certificates. And guess what? It happens all the time. For example, Turk Trust, you know, they signed a bogus certificate for Google.com, right? So people are now trying to address this problem uh, through what's called a certificate transparency. And one of the core ideas that's very important for certificate transparency is having an indelible log so that people can discover bad certificates that have been issued uh, and then revoke those. Um, and so, uh, so the nice thing about uh, using something like SCP for this is that you could have, you know, uh, you know, Google has, you know, probably a million times more computing power than like, you know, some of these smaller organizations on here. Um, but they can all be on equal footing in terms of the consensus portal because each one has their own, uh, their own signing key. This becomes even more important when you start talking about end-to-end -end encryption for email, right? Because if, say, Gmail is, is starts issuing certificates for all their users, well, Google actually probably doesn't want to be in a position where someone could come coerce them and say, hey, please issue this fraudulent certificate for one of your users. We want to spy on their email, right? And so by being able to say, oh, well, you know, we could sign that, but, then, but the ACLU is not going to sign off on this, so then people are going to realize that something has happened if we do this. Um, that, would be, uh, that, would be, uh, that would put everybody in a, in a better position. Okay. So that's it. Questions? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, so th that's really cool that you managed to um, kind of make uh, traditional Byzantine fault tolerant consensus algorithms more flexible and to allow uh, different nodes to join the network. Um, can you uh, backtrack two slides? So uh, I, I have a few concerns about uh, SCP uh, regarding the flexible trust uh, checkbox. Mm -hmm. um, so is my understanding correct? Uh, like I, I looked at the paper uh, when it came out uh, a little while ago. Um, from my understanding back then was that SCP uh, allows, uh, for, like forks can happen in SCP. In other words, uh, disjoint, I, I think that's the word that you used here. Uh, if it's misconfigured, yeah. Uh, but, but say they configured it correctly uh, and there was a Byzantine node, like some node got hacked. Right. And so then that could create a fork in the network. Is that true? Well, uh, but that would be, I mean, ideally you want, you want enough overlap that, I mean, basically you would want, you would have to hack like five out of these seven organizations. So if you can compromise Google, Microsoft, Mozilla, the ACLU, and the EFF, maybe like, yeah, you can create a fork and, uh, you know, even if you don't compromise VeriSign and Turk Trust as well. But, but yeah, y you want enough overlap that, it's, that you think it's hard to, uh, to compromise all those. But yeah, if you're uh, extremely powerful and you can actually compromise all of those, or if it turns out that people didn't set up their quorum slices to have sufficient overlap and redundancy, then yeah, you run into problems. And, and so my concern w after reading the SCP paper was that, um, in, uh, in SCP, if such a fork does happen, um, then it seems potentially dangerous for payments to be used. Like say if Japan gets forked off somehow, uh, however it might happen, a misconfigured configuration yeah. or some kind of attack. Um, there didn't seem to be a way to then recover from that situation. Uh, it just seemed 
like it would just create two versions of Stellar into perpetuity. Yeah, so this is this is actually something that has happened on, on the internet, right? So you end up in situations where, you know, Cogent and level three were both kind of tier one ISPs, right? And then level three is like, okay, Cogent, we don't think you're really a, a tier one ISP, so how about you pay us for transit or we, we de-peer you? And then Cogent says, I dare you, right? So then level three deep here is cogent and then level three's customers like scream and whatever and then the two they have, they have to like work out some kind of deal and then the settlement details are private probably and negotiated some use of multi-exit discriminator or something. But yes, they managed to reconcile because the market pressures for reconciliation were so high. So, so the internet kind of enables these kind of what David Clark calls these tussle spaces. Um, where basically people uh, enter the game with whatever clout that they have um, and, uh, and then it kind of seems to, to work and it also seems to allow a lot of innovation. So, so that's what we're hoping, but yeah, of course we can't predict the future and, and weird things can happen. But in that example that you just gave, um, that wasn't a financial system, that was just like a, you know, messages being routed on a network. Yeah. Um, and if they can, you know, recombine their networks again, you can continue routing messages. Yeah. But in the case of like a global database, if it becomes forked, if you can't reconcile it, that seems kind of disastrous. Yeah, but it's much more likely. I mean, like let's let's take this example of like these seven institutions here. Like, it's not that likely that you're going to be able to to kill five of these, right? So what's much more likely is that you'll kill three, and so you'll deny deny liveness to the system. So, like. You, you'll probably grind the system, the system will grind to a halt. Um, if you really can actually co compromise sufficient nodes that the, the whole world starts working, then probably the, the quorum slices were, were misconfigured, I would say. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks again so much for presenting. Um, given the sort of critical nature of the topology of the network in question and mm -hmm. how these quorum slices are created, I'm kind of curious, um, as of today, and I know it's still kind of in, in mm -hmm. beta or alpha state, but uh, what the topography of the network looks like today and, and who the end users are in Stellar as it exists today. Yeah, so I don't I actually don't know currently. I mean, last I checked, there were like something like 10 nodes or something, but it may have, uh, it may have I actually don't have like the latest uh, okay. information. And I think with most way trust, so. Hey, hey. Uh, you mentioned uh, encrypted email as mm -hmm. one of the use cases. So I'm yeah. assuming those first tier um, institutions would be signing uh, other people's keys and then there would be verification. How would that look in practice? Would the client, the email client, actually go ahead and verify those certificates or how the whole system would that um, work? Yeah, so part of, the, part of the problem is like privacy. Like people don't want to publish their list of, of email addresses, like all the Gmail users. Um, and so that's, what, that's where like Connex, for example, well, addresses this problem, but to kind of present the straw man, just to give you a flavor, let, let's ignore the privacy for now. What Google could do is they could sort of, you know, every day they could like publish an updated list of like everybody's public keys and, you know, publish it as a Merkle tree or something so you don't have to download the whole thing to get it. And then these other people would basically you would need consensus that they had evolved their list of keys properly, mm -hmm. right? And so if they come in and like swap my advertised public key without my consent, like it's not signed by my previous key, then whoever like next sends email to me should get some, you know, big warning saying like, warning, it looks like this account has been like reinitialized or something. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, you know, I don't know what the exact UI uh, inter right. interface right. should be, but. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my second question, the follow-up question would be, do you foresee a system where uh, Google would be just taken out of the question and the clients would be responsible for the keys with those authorities without Google's. Um, well, I, well, I mean, I'm using I'm using Google as a, as a as a proxy for like a big mail provider. So mm -hmm. it would be, uh, you know, Google would do it for Gmail. Mm -hmm. Stanford would do it for Stanford right. users. Yahoo would do it for for Yahoo uh, users. Right. Mm -hmm. The idea is like every institution would publish the the public keys of their email users, mm -hmm. um, but then all the other organizations would keep them honest, so that once they've published a key, they can't change that key without. Uh, without people who are sending email realizing that something bad happened. Sure, sure. thank you. Hi, uh, so I noticed that state doesn't have owners in your system. So in crypto, for example, the outputs have owners and they can basically change the state by signing so the, the private So the output key. are owners, what do you mean? So, um, for example, if I have a private key mm -hmm. to a, a coin, 
essentially I, can, I could sign, a, sign the change and say these uh, coins now move to some other address. And that is an example of, I suppose, an irrefutable statement because only I have the private key. And right. So here, uh, you don't need that. No, no, no you, uh, you do. So there's two totally separate levels. So let's say that we're using these, these nodes were making up a payment network, right? right. So what these nodes are doing is they're, uh, what they're uh, uh, reaching consensus on is kind of like the order of operations. But there's this separate notion of what is and is not a valid operation that everybody agrees to, right? So, uh, so we need this, you know, we need this consensus network to agree that, you know, I sent this payment to you before I sent it to this other person. But like, uh, separate from that, that payment had better actually okay. be signed by me or else like Okay, thank you, thank yeah. you for the clarification. One more question. When you create the quorum, mm -hmm. is that something, uh, in practice, how does it occur? Do I have to create my own um, quorum? Is it automated? Can it be? Well, you have to, right now you have to configure, uh, there's a configuration file we have to put the people in your quorum slices. And so. that is, okay, so it's, uh, it's a manual process. It, yeah, okay. and I mean, it's it's a little bit like suppose you want to set up an ISP. Well, you're going to have to, you know, buy transit from people, and uh, and so you have to figure that. So the equations are very different in the sense that you actually have to pay for transit. It costs someone money to provide you transit. Whereas here, the equivalent of of buying transit for someone is is depending on them, which just means like you need to like check a digital signature by them every five seconds. So it's much lighter weight, and we anticipate more intersection. But yeah, you still have this kind of decision to make. Thank you. Yeah. Um, now, uh, bef before we wrap up, I can take more questions, but I also want to point out that if you're interested in this, we're actually hiring at Stellar, uh, and you know we're right here in San Francisco, uh, so uh, very convenient location, great bunch of people to work with. Um, so uh, anyway. Uh, hi. Has this been published in a peer-reviewed journal? It's under submission currently. Cool. Uh, hi there. So you've mentioned a couple of times the relationship between this and internet routing. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you talked to the, any of the folks who are actually operating routing infrastructure to see whether they would be interested in a model like this for routing? Um, no, I haven't. Some some fairly uh, some fairly big things we need to change in order for yeah. that to happen. Like we need to change autonomous system numbers into public keys, for example, you know, which wouldn't fit even with the new 32-bit AS numbers, like wouldn't fit. So uh, I think this is probably like too radical for them at this point. Okay. Um, I think we're, we're more likely to get critical mass behind the idea in these other areas first. Maybe once it's like really taken off, then, then we can, you know, for BGP, you know, Four seven or something. Yeah. You know, like okay. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. Stefano Foresti. I have uh, run into an announcement for a homeland security proposal on application of blockchain to identity management privacy due next week. <coughs> it turns out that I have uh, started a project with uh, working on privacy and I'm looking for someone who is uh, a crypto expert with blockchain experience to join me to write this proposal. And so if you if anyone fits this, please come and talk to me. The requirement is that U.S. citizen and uh, the resume CD looks good to show blockchain background. Thank you. Um, so Bitcoin is a state machine. It's an account. Uh, handling state machine and then Ethereum is another state machine it's a state machine that can run any state machine it's alright uh, Tendermint what we recently did was we created a network protocol called TMSP that allows you to create your state machine in any language so it's like a 
this new way of creating blockchains that's different than uh, a Bitcoin based system or an Ethereum smart contract. It's like you can write your smart contracts in any language. And then Tendermint is a blockchain engine that powers your application. It's a new way to create blockchains. If you're interested, uh, just uh, check out our website. Thanks. One more? One more. One more shot. Hey, I'm Tom. Uh, I'm a, one of the co-founders at BitOasis, and one of the pains we had was uh, sending encrypted email between us and a team because you have a lot of private information that you're trying to send. And it's such a pain that we rarely did it, just for the highest kind of uh, security stuff. And um, I'm working on a Gmail plugin. It's a browser plugin that would make email encryption so easy. The goal for me is that I could install this for my grandma and she could use email the same way she used it until now. And she wouldn't even have to know or care it's being encrypted. But for people that have this functionality enabled, it will, the, those emails will go encrypted. Um, if you guys, any of you are interested in helping me out as testers uh, of that plugin, or if this is an area that you're interested in and would like to uh, make some change uh, and get more people to get have emails encrypted, let me know. Just catch me here and uh, we're going to talk. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And thank you, David, for your presentation. Thanks for inviting me.